everyone. When we started this uh, series with the intro, just the basic introduction to um, Fermat's last theorem before we got started in the details, um, we started by going over, we've been going over the elliptic curves over rational numbers and then real numbers. And we had one thing left to do, which was complex numbers, which I thought I was going to be able to do very quickly. And we would move on then uh, to some kind of a brief introduction to modular forms and then move on to really trying to learn the details of, uh, of, of elliptic curves and so on. But as I was thinking more about elliptic curves and looking into elliptic curves over complex numbers, I realized that, uh, first of all, they are central to uh, the entire proof of Fermat's last theorem. The theorem is actually, th th so there's all the different sort of realms of mathematics have these structures that add some kind of structure to, to uh, the, the question at hand. And so a lot of math is about making connections from one thing to another, because if you can associate one piece with another piece, then you can use all of the machinery from this new piece back on the other, on the other uh, topic. So the topic that we're looking at is just you know Fermat's Fermat's theorem that x squared plus y squared uh, does not equal z squared for or uh, y x to the n plus y to the n does not equal uh, z to the n when n is greater than or equal to two. That's what we want to look at, right? Uh, this is over integers or rational numbers. And it turns out, though, but then as, as we know, we've talked about it a couple times, the, the way that this was proven was by proving that elliptic curves are the same as modular forms. Whatever that means, that's what we're trying to figure out. So we're looking at ellipt elliptic curves right now. But it turns out that the way that elliptic curves so I've already showed you how this equation relates to elliptic curves, which is what we looked at. So elliptic curves are y squared equals x cubed plus something like ax plus b. And we've already looked at how these are connected. Um, what we haven't yet looked at is how these elliptic curves are related to modular forms. And that's actually what we're getting closer to. So elliptic curves on the one hand have all of this algebra structure to them, but modular forms are purely a complex number thing. And it turns out that the way you get from elliptic curves to modular forms is all about complex numbers. So I decided we need to look in more detail at complex numbers. And um, there's, and, and then another issue is in, in any math class, in any math subject, you need to have some kind of a foundation that you're all building from. You need to make sure that you're all on the same page when you start before you go forward. And I think for all of us, like if we have our sort of uh, topics of math and knowledge of them, there's things that we know really, really well. And then as it gets more advanced, it kind of goes down. And then at some point, it just completely ends. So, uh, you know, like high school stuff, um, I know really well. The first couple of years of college, I know really well. I've taken more classes, but I wasn't paying as much attention. And then when it gets up to maybe around, you know, uh, some of the more advanced topics, like I took topology, but I don't remember that at all. And then anything above that, like elliptic curves, for instance, don't know at all. So uh, we need to, so I have to assume some amount of knowledge before we, as we're, as we're starting out. And I think that the place to do that is right in here. At least it's where, it's where I am. So uh, I think we can assume, or I'm going to assume that everyone knows basic uh, high school math very well, meaning algebra, polynomials, and stuff like that. And probably calculus pretty well, maybe not 100% well. So where I'm going to start us is with um, getting up to speed with multi 
variable calculus, and then also complex numbers. So this series of um, videos is going to be complex numbers leading to something called the Weierstrass equation, which uh, sounds obscure. It is obscure, but it's the center, actually, in some ways, to the um, to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And uh, uh, and then we'll um, we'll be able to to move on from there. So I'm going to um, so this this then will this is what gets us to um, elliptic curves ultimately. So this video I'm just going to um, give a quick sort of uh, outline of where we're going, and then for the next it's going to take us several weeks. I'm going to go through complex uh, calculus in detail. And um, along the way, we can sort of learn some stuff about complex numbers without knowing any calculus. But then what we really need to know is uh, complex calculus, complex integration. And so I think that to do that, it's important to make sure that we all are up to speed with uh, multivariable calculus as well. So I'm going to have a series on multivariable calculus as well, but I think that's going to be I'm going to go ahead and finish the complex numbers and then go back and do that. So it'll sort of support the complex numbers, but we're going to do it kind of backward. So first I want to start with what is an elliptic curve? We've talked about it in terms of just what they look like. And I've given you a definition of, um, of the, the equation of what one is um, and some properties of them and things like that. But why are they called elliptic curves? So I wanted to mention this to you because this is actually one of the things that we're going to be getting to with Weierstrass. It's one of the things that Weierstrass was talking about. So something that early mathematicians thought about a lot was like arc length, for instance. And so Euler, who is very important to um, complex uh, numbers, complex calculus also, um, one of the things that he was trying to do was find an equation or a method for solving the arc length of a um, ellipse. And it turns out it's very strange because with a circle, the arc length of a circle, just the circumference, that's something we learn very young. It's the circumference is two pi r. So you just multiply pi by basically the diameter and you get the circumference. It turns out that the arc length of an uh, ellipse is way more complicated, and it turns out that there's no way to calculate the arc length of an ellipse using elementary functions that in, in calculus, meaning um, you know polynomials, trigonomic, trigonometric functions, and so on. It doesn't work in a in a pretty way. So the equation for arc length of a of an ellipse is, uh, this isn't important, I'm just gonna write it down and we'll see where um, where we go from, from here. It's a squared sine squared theta plus b squared cosine squared theta d theta, the whole thing square rooted. So that's obviously very hard to integrate. Even Euler couldn't figure out how to do it. But he was so intrigued by it that they, uh, mathematicians have spent a lot of time trying to figure this out, trying to simplify it, trying to find a way to do something with it. And they haven't been able to really, you know, make it work in a nice way that we can learn about in high school or college. But they have simplified this somewhat. And they've gotten it uh, into something that looks like, that looks like this. K squared X over uh, X one minus x, one minus k squared x, whole thing square root, uh, dx. So we're not gonna worry about what this is right now or maybe ever, but uh, this integral will give you the arc length of a, um, an elliptic curve. And so what's, once they started looking at this, you notice this is just a polynomial. That's good, that's easy to deal with. And down here is a cubic equation with three distinct um, roots. So in looking at this equation, they started just looking at the denominator, which is, um, so they started looking at this equation 
in relation to that, to the above, um, 1 minus k squared x. So if you square both sides, you get y squared equals a cubic equation here, right? Oops. This, in other words, is an elliptic function. So it turns out that what elliptic functions are, they're the inverse function of, um, of the arc length, uh, the arc length um, formula. And this then, it turns out, has all sorts of far-reaching uh, uses, implications, connections, and so on. And so this is what so much um, uh, focus has been on since then. It's just the y squared equals x cubed, blah, blah, blah. So, um, so that's where elliptic functions come from. It's not important to what we're looking at, but it's just interesting to know, especially why are they called elliptic functions? That's why. It's the inverse of this equation, which is the, um, the formula for the arc length of an, eclipse, of an ellipse. So, okay. Um, so, let me see. What else do I want to say? So again, working with um, the elliptic curves over uh, the elliptic curves over um, rational numbers and over real numbers, uh, everything was very straightforward. In fact, we did all of it just with algebra. There was only one tiny part where we had to use some calculus in order to find the uh, slope of. Um, the slope of a line when the two, as the two points approach each other, then we were looking for the slope of that line. That was the only place we had to use calculus so far. Now for complex numbers, we just make an enormous leap forward in complexity or in, in advance in the, uh, in how advanced the, um, the, uh, the math is. So I won't say it's more difficult because we don't want to think that way. We can do it but it's way more advanced than what we learned in the first couple of years of school. Okay, so with all that, I'm just going to go now quickly through the topics that we're gonna cover in the next several weeks that we'll build. We're gonna start with the, we're gonna start with rational numbers and build toward uh, a, an understanding of complex numbers, complex integration, these Weierstrass equations, which I'm about to tell you what they are, and then how that leads to uh, elliptic um, elliptic functions. Uh, remember, um, we're on this journey together and uh, I'm relying on your help as well. We're just barely getting started. So um, I want to make sure that, that I don't lose anyone on the way. And then as things get harder, I'm going to need your help with figuring things out as we go. So uh, hopefully we can get through all this together. And if there's anything that I say that that is ever uh, confusing or muddled, then please let me know in the comments and I will uh, explain it better. Um, okay, so what's the connection between uh, complex analysis and algebra? Um, so it turns out the Weierstrass equation, and again, we're going to, I'm going to explain what this is shortly, but I want to show you where we're going. So this is what we're leading toward with all of the complex integration is this equation is so important, it has its own letter. You know you've made it in math when you get your own letter. Squared equals four P cubed minus G two, uh, did I do that right? P minus G three. So this letter represents the Weierstrass equation. And this equation is amazing because this is the uh, derivative of the equation, and the derivative of the equation squared equals this, four times the uh, equation cubed plus these, these other terms. And look what this is. This is just an elliptic curve. So what's amazing about this is this is a complex calculus equation, and this is the derivative of the equation, 
and all together they come they make this relationship that becomes this elliptic function which then leads us back into all of the um, algebra that we were talking about before it's really quite cool so i just wanted to wet your wet your appetite there this is what we're going to lead to uh now so the one, the one last thing that I want to say about math, my sort of philosophical thing that I think is so interesting about, about this proof and about math in general, I've always felt that there are kind of two sides to math. There's discrete math and there's sort of continuous math. Discrete math is what we've been doing so far for the most part, like, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, groups with, you know, the X and the, or E and X and E and X and... There's just like a, a very simple pattern and it's very countable and so on. Calculus and analysis is completely different than that. It's all about uh, continuous numbers and that no matter how small a gap you, you divide, there's always more numbers between it and more numbers between it. And what does it mean to be continuous? So the amazing thing is, it seems like our Fermat's last theorem equation is very much over here in the algebra section. But again, what we're going to do is connect it to the calculus, do the work over in the calculus. This is what Wiles did. And then that's, that work is going to add structure that will then be, uh, that will allow us to prove that Fermat's last theorem was right. So um, it's kind of cool. And on the other hand, it's a little bit uncomfortable because I believe, at least for me, I think that most people are more comfortable with one or the other. For me, I think much more in the um, discrete kind of way. This, this stuff is fun. Analysis isn't so fun, but I think we have to find a way to make analysis equally fun to us, or maybe uh, some people listening can uh, help make that more fun if I don't find something fun. Um, anyway, because, we're gonna, because we have to understand this in order to get back and make the connection there. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.